traditional forms of user research are fucking lame. <laughs> and I've come to believe that because I've been working in software design for now over 25 years on hundreds of products, and I've dealt with way too many clients pushing back at me and not letting me conduct user research for so many different reasons. When people think about traditional user research, they think about ethnography, about field research, that you might be sent somewhere like to Africa for a few months, where you'll have your diaries, and you'll send them, bring, take notes, and talk to people. Maybe you'll empathize with them. Lovely overused word. And then maybe you'll come back to your enterprise and transcribe these notes into findings that hopefully the people, the stakeholders, can use so that they can ultimately inform a product so that it's geared toward what people want. And then we have this other traditional form that's called user research, but really it's called usability studies. And this typically happens at the end of a product's life cycle. The product's already been built, and they bring in target users-ish into a usability lab while dorks watch them, and they sit there like lab rats testing out the software that I would rather just give to my mom and say, can you use this thing or not? <laughs> Do we really need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars going around the country using usability labs? So it's made me very frustrated because the clients feel this way because they don't want to spend the time or they don't have the budgets, but they want to learn from customers. And they want to figure out how they can make products that people will pay for. So I started thinking after reading several books, especially more contemporary business books, starting with Lean Startup, and then, of course, becoming familiar with Steve Blank, with uh, Four Steps to the Epiphany, and reading Running Lean. And I thought about, can I come up with a mashup of a lot of their ideas to do a more methodical form of user research, one that is validated, one where we think about the product not as a product until it's sold, but just as an experiment an experiment to be tested by doing user research. So I want to talk about how I got this term guerrilla user research, because there's a lot of people out there that think guerrilla user research is cafe research, where you go into a cafe and you go up to some random guy and you shove your iPhone in their face and ask them what they think about it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about old school, guerrilla fighters, such as Juana Galan. 200 years ago, Napoleon, guy from France, right? He's like trying to take over Europe. Portugal is causing him problems, so he decides to invade Spain. La Mancha, where she lives. And she's like, this is not happening. She talks to her chicks and organizes a bunch of bitches to destroy Napoleon's formidable army. And they invade La Mancha, and she stands around and just sort of oversees all these women who are pouring hot oil from the top floors of the building onto the streets and burning the troops as they come in, scalding them. And another chick's throwing tacks across the roads, and the horses are stepping on them and falling over. And doing these kinds of crazy, cost-efficient tactics. And ultimately, he had to back off. He did not take over Spain. And so I worship people like Juana Galan. And so I thought about, well, I think we can have gorilla, not the monkey gorilla, the one with two R's and two L's, a form of guerrilla user research. And so I thought about different techniques to basically transpose it over. 
And so I want to walk you through a case study that I did for a startup client. Now, this case study um, was near and dear to the heart of my client um, because he had been an engineer and he made a lot of money, but at the same time, his son became addicted to cocaine. So he had this problem where he kept sticking his kid in different rehabs in Los Angeles, and they would literally give him coke in the rehabs. So he's bouncing in and out of expensive rehabs, and he's like, why is this happening? Why isn't there like a website I can go to for unbiased reviews where I could learn about uh, whether this is legit or not? And there wasn't, so he decided he would build a platform. And he spent a million dollars and did what he thought, you know, everything right. He did surveys, interviewed people, marketing campaigns. You know, he had engineers do a database. He had subject matter experts put together reviews. And some people came to the website, but 99% of them bounced away. And after one year, he had not one person book a rehab center. And that's why and when he came to me. And he said, Jamie, I'd like to hire you and your team to redo our user experience design. We're certain it's because of the look and feel. And I said, well, yeah, your site looks like shit. But I suspect that that's not the reason that people are bouncing away from your website. And therefore, I'm not interested in working with you unless you're going to hire me to conduct an experiment so we can talk to customers and figure out why the hell they're bouncing away from their website, because you're certainly not going to get that data just by looking at that one metric. And so that's what we did. And I want to walk you through that story. And there's three phases to guerrilla user research. The first phase is the planning phase. This takes the longest. We need to get our prototype ready, and it's basically, you could call it an MVP, but for me, often it's just uh, the most important key experiences of the value proposition that we're going to put in front of our hypothesized customer so that they get what the product is supposed to do for them. And then we need to write the different questions that go along with that. And I'll get to that in a second. The second phase is the interview phase. And that just takes place over one day. And it involves prepping and coordinating and logistics and, of course, conducting the interviews. And then the last phase, look how short that one is. I wrote one to four hours, but typically I do it in one minute. Because by the end of the day, we know. We know what's wrong. So let's start with the planning phase. So there are five steps. And the first step before you decide, I want to go and learn if my value prop is on target, is you have to determine the objectives. What is it that you need to learn? Do you want to learn, do I have the right targeted customer? Do you want to learn what are the main features that they need? Do you want to learn how much they're willing to pay or how often they're going to use it so that they can monetize it? These are the things that you need to figure out before you even start the, on the process, is what, are, what is the most important thing you're going to learn? Because I am not talking about usability. We're talking about product strategy and about not building a product because it's not ultimately, why build a product if nobody's going to pay for it or if nobody wants it? This is what I try to stop as a UX strategist. So then comes time to making the prototype and figuring out the questions that are going to go with the screen. Sometimes I'll do them in Photoshop. Other times I use rapid prototyping tools like just in mine. But the point is, is you know, we're not sitting around making site maps and wireframes. We are knocking out the most important screens that walk them through the customer journey of the key experiences so they get the aha moment. And so maybe we'll slightly made the site look a little bit better with the screens. But we came up with questions that were aligned, not so much with usability, but whether we, they would actually understand what we were showing them and if they would use it or not. So then comes the fun part. You're like a film location scout. 
and you have to drive around figuring out what cafe that you can do the study in where you're not going to get thrown out. It's kind of like a flash mob meets a field research study. And there's an art to doing it, because we know there's cafes all over the place. And you might say, why even in a cafe? Why can't I just go do it in my co-working space? Well, I'd say, well, because the people who are being interviewed may not be tech people and might be intimidated by all the other people getting around, the idea, walking around. They, the idea is that we want people to feel relaxed and to give us the truth. So you say, well, why don't I do it in a lab? Well, that's cost money. I'm trying to figure out a way that I can do this for the lowest budget possible. You say, well, why don't I go to their house? Well, that's creepy. Why don't they come to my house? I don't want them in my house. <laughs> and you can't sit at a hotel. People are going to be running around. It needs to be in a controlled environment. And so we need to find a cafe where we can be out of the line of sight of the people who work at the cafe. So my favorite cafes tend to be ones that have stairs that go up, and I can hide out in the back and basically take over. Or they could be ones that have all kinds of different rooms in the back, because they don't know what the hell we're doing up there. So then, of course, we need to find participants. And a lot of us don't have the budgets to hire expensive recruiters. Now, in the case of the Drug Rehab Center, we were lucky to be given a subject matter expert who constantly uh, interviewed lying drug addicts who were trying to get their way into rehab so they didn't have to go to jail. And so he was able to help us, you know, screen the different, every, I mean, what drug addict doesn't want $50 to look at a stupid prototype and give their feedback? I mean, I'd sign up for that right now. So we needed somebody, we, we put out the ad, we got hundreds and hundreds of calls just on Craigslist. People advertise for research studies on Craigslist all the time. They're in different sections depending on what city or country you live. And I actually have this toolkit, and I'll send out the URL, it's a free UX strategy toolkit, but it has all these uh, different templates in there that I use. But the basic idea is on the screener template, it's where we try, and these are fake names, okay? These are not actual phone numbers of the drug addicts. You can't call them up to buy some shit. <laughs> but we set up these interviews by talking to them and asking them questions that only the, these drug, drug addicts would know the answers to. So what drug rehabs have you applied to? How much did you pay? What happened? Was it a bad experience? Was it a good experience? Making sure, or maybe it was a loved one, but making sure these people were legit, that they were our target customers. Getting their phone numbers, figuring out when they could be scheduled, and then we, because we had like 50, we applied a rating system. Like one would be some guy who just sounded like an idiot and really didn't, hadn't really paid cash to go to the drug treatment center, and a three would be someone who'd maybe been to two or three and paid and had all kinds of information they could give us about our value proposition. And so then once we had our threes and our two pluses, we called them back and scheduled them so they would be at the cafe at their scheduled time, and we were running two different tables at once. They had to be heavily screened, because otherwise you're tainting your sample set. So then comes the interview phase, my favorite part. So here's how this one went down. It was in Hollywood, where I happened to have been born, a few blocks away, at this cafe called Cafe Vita. And so my user research assistant showed up early, because we needed to take over the cafe. She buys some coffee, and then she gives a big fat tip, five bucks. Because they want, we want them to love us, because we're about to take over their space for free. And also, we want to give them money. We want to be good customers. Sarah grabs her coffee and heads upstairs. And of course, what she finds is a bunch of fucking Silver Lake hipsters up there trying to write screenplays. <laughs> No tables. So she's prepared, because we've done this now for clients over a dozen times, with numerous jackets. So there's Sarah sitting over there. She grabs her first table, and she's waiting for people to leave. And as they do, she throws jackets over the chairs. 
at each of these tables so we could take over two tops, four tops. And we make sure, of course, that there's Wi-Fi, that there's AC, because we're going to be plugged in for six to eight hours. The tables are cleared. There's nothing, there's no one that's going to get into our way, that we have a good line of sight of the stairs. But we really position ourselves in a tactical way. I show up. I, of course, order tea, because coffee gives me diarrhea. <laughs> I give a big fat tip, and then I walk upstairs. I say, Sarah, get the hell out of the four top. You go sit at the smaller table. <laughs> and I start setting up. We both pull out either our laptops or our iPads, or uh, iPads where we have our solution demo. And we start getting ready. Once we're ready, I've got the demo out. I'm testing it, making sure the screens are good. And now it's time to tell Michael, our production coordinator, who's standing outside, that we're ready. I say, Michael, send up participant number one now. Michael's out there freezing his ass off on a 70 degree day in Los Angeles, looking official with his clipboard. Drug addict number one, recovered, of course. <laughs> appears, because we need to block them at the door. We can't just have them coming in willy-nilly, kind of looking around, going up to the counter, like, hi, I'm here for the drug addiction store interview. Uh, do you know where that is? And they're like, what? So we have someone there who is making sure that we, they're greeted, we check them off the list, and then we bring them immediately upstairs, and we, he introduces them to the person to, who's going to interview them. I ask my, when I do interviews, I typically stand up or certainly big smile, greet them because we're so grateful to have them there to give us this information. And we want them to feel comfortable to be in this neutral environment. And then the next thing we do is pay them. We pay them up front. We pay them to be honest. We pay them because we don't want them to be sitting there wondering if they're going to get paid at the very end. And we don't want them to be worried that what if they say the wrong thing that they're not going to get paid. And because we're paying them in cash, we definitely put it in an envelope so it doesn't look like a drug deal, <laughs> which was kind of ironic for this drug treatment center thing. So then the interview commences. And we do it in the format that I learned from Ash Maria, where we start by asking questions about the problem and you know how you know how did you currently you know how did you last find your treatment centers? Was it a good or bad experience? Getting them into the mental model, the mindset of what the experience for them was before. So they are thinking about the problem. And then we start moving forward and showing them the solution. Michael's sitting outside and waiting for more participants to show up, and the interviews are going along. But we're not recording them, because recording interviews in this context is time consuming and just going to just be more bullshit. Why can't we just focus? Why can't we have a note taker who's sitting there distilling the actual answers that we need to hear that are specific to the questions and getting them into a live spreadsheet. We use a, a Google spreadsheet. And this way, we don't have to have them worried about, God, I'm going to answer some personal information. It might end up on the internet. We tell them we are not recording in the ad. We tell them they don't see any recording devices. And it forces us to be completely present. It also saves time for somebody later to have to transcribe them. Instead, we're actually totally focused on the interview, and I always ask to try to have a note taker there if we can, and they don't even have to know anything about it. They're just distilling the notes in there and trying to not add, put everything down there, but just the answers to the questions that we need because we need to get to measured results. Now, the ideal situation is to have the stakeholder there as a note taker. So here we have my client, this guy there, and he was the one who hired us to do it. And I needed him to hear from the horse's, I mean, drug addict's mouth, 
why the hell they would or would not use his website. And after interview after interview, they kept telling him why. And at a certain point, he had to cover his own mouth to stop from asking questions because he was so upset that his business model was broken. As they kept telling him, oh, there's no way I would go book a drug treatment center um, using this website unless I visited it first, which basically invalidated you know, his way of being able to be like Priceline, where you don't give out the name. And we started learning exactly why nobody was booking anything. But by having him there, it cut out the middleman, it cut to the chase, and he was basically able to truly meet his customers face to face. And instead of me having to, after the fact, show him all of our research and say, here's what happened, he was there. And I ask my, st my stakeholders, or I require them in most cases, whether they be agencies or enterprises or startups, come to these interviews and hear and learn from your customers. And so what is the, what, what's the cost of this type of study? Well, this one cost $5,000. We did it quickly, we did it efficiently, and we got back really, really good answers. And then the analysis phase in this particular case didn't take very long because we basically had eight people who said there was no way I would use this thing and book a rehab without knowing there's na the name. I would need to go tour it first. And, I, and just so many different reasons that basically invalid his business model and helped him to pivot to a B2B model instead. But we were able to do it by looking at the spreadsheet and knowing immediately here are our answers because we can cross, look at them across a grid and get validated learnings. That's what we want, is yes or no, would they use this solution? Yes or no, would they pay for this solution? Or would they constantly use it so we could ultimately monetize them? This is what we want, validated, measurable learnings about the product strategy, not the usability, I don't care at this point if they can figure out how a drop-down menu works, you know, or they can make it through the onboarding. That's irrelevant if they're not going to actually use the product. And so this is how I practice guerrilla user research in a methodical way by talking to people and going through these different techniques. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. But what if I work in an enterprise, Jamie? My boss isn't going to let me do this, I think. So I tell you this. Don't be a pussy. <laughs> or a kitty. A kitty. Do it anyway. OK? Do it because you care about the product that you're working on. And do it at night, after work or do it on the weekends, do it on the sly, or beg your boss to please just give you a week so that you can actually learn whether or right this product vision is on track. It's important to do user research no matter what, but if the choice is no user research or a little bit, and I'm gonna have to spend a couple of nights or a weekend doing it and show the evidence to the product manager, VP of software, or the stakeholder and say, I happen to do this because I cared. I'm not sure what do you, you know actually what you think, but you want them to come to the conclusion. This is called manipulation to get buy-in. <laughs> this is how I win. And what do you think? And usually they look at it and they go, wow, hmm, that's really interesting. And hopefully that way you can come to a consensus without it being this thing like, oh, you did this thing behind my back, blah, blah, blah. And so the takeaways would be we want to conduct methodical guerrilla user research because it's a get out of the building technique for conducting affordable yet efficient field research in a neutral environment. It also requires getting a realistic version of the solution, whether it be a prototype or a bunch of screen grabs, but not a wireframe, OK? I can barely have clients make sense of wireframes. Don't put wireframes in front of customers. Put real screens so it looks real. 
and make sure they're your hypothesized customers and that ideally bring the stakeholders along. Make it like a fun field trip. The next thing is think of it as an experiment and it needs to be structured Otherwise, it's tainted. It's just like a science experiment. If it's not controlled, then the results that you get aren't true. And so we need to measure the feedback in a methodical way. Did we validate the business model? Did we validate the value proposition? Did we validate the key experiences? Yes or no. And if you decide that 80% signal back of yes is good, then move forward. If you get 30% of the people saying no, then maybe you need to pivot or do something different in a serious way. And lastly, the goal of conducting methodical guerrilla user research is to help you immediately value, validate or invalidate, in most cases, assumptions about your value prop and business model. This is not traditional user research. This is guerrilla user research. Thank you. It's the best example of storytelling I've probably ever seen. Thank you. <laughs> I was wildly entertained, and I think you had some extremely good tips there also. We'll just take a couple of questions, because then it's break time. Uh, we had a couple here that were pretty good. Um, have you had any success conducting research in a virtual format rather than, a ca than cafes? Yes, I have, actually, because I've had instances where the clients, excuse me, the people that we are interviewing we're scattered around the world, so we conducted the interviews over Skype. And it's not ideal, but um, you know, at least you're making eye contact with them. And as long as they, you know, you can show them the prototype by screen sharing, I think that will work. You know, I, I know there's sites like user testing and, and all these other different um, platforms out there, but for me, it's really about having them see my face and having building that trust, building that connection and going through, you know, using the same techniques, but you know, or Skype or, or whatever video conferencing tool that you can use for desktop share. Yes. Uh, I think people want an ending to the story, so they're asking what happened to the attic site? Did they overhaul the business plan and website, fold the business or continue as is? Hmm. Well you can I'm not going to plug my book, UX Strategy, uh, where it does give away the answers, but it was a sad <laughs> ending. It was a sad ending for the client um, because what was happening was um, the Affordable Care Act was just coming out, and basically um, the way that all the legislation in California, it was changing so fast, and he pretty much gave up at this point because he could pivot to a B2B model, where he would be working directly with therapists, let's say, who might recommend their clients to come to the rehab centers. But ultimately, he decided to give up on this value proposition, and thankfully, his son did eventually get clean. OK, and the last one's really, really quick. Sample size, what number of participants is ideal for a study like this? I would start, I like even numbers, so I would start with 10. Um, but you know, you go out and do it again. Like if you get you know into two or three interviews and you start realizing like you're not asking the right questions or your prototypes not making sense, stop what you're doing and reschedule. But start with ten just because it's a round number, and that's usually what I aspire to get to. Thank you very very much. Thank you very much.